You're listening to A Day in the Life podcast brought to you by the International Myeloma Foundation. We hope this podcast provides messages of hope and resilience for those in the myeloma community and beyond. Today, we are talking to Andy Sninsky, who was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in 2008 at the age of 59. Some of our listeners may be familiar with Andy, who is the self-described that crazy guy on a bike. Andy claims this moniker because despite a myeloma diagnosis, undergoing chemotherapy, radiation, and an autologous stem cell transplant, Andy has managed to complete multiple bicycle tours of Europe and across the U.S. and Canada. In fact, today we're catching up with him as he is mid-tour in Orangeville, Ontario, Canada. To begin, I want to say welcome, Andy. My first question for you is, how many miles have you tracked on this particular bike ride so far? Okay, this particular bike ride, I have done 300 miles in about five days to get from uh, the border of the USA and Canada up to Orangeville, which is kind of the suburb of Toronto. And where's your finish line for this ride? How many more miles and where's the location? at a thousand miles. I decided this year that I would ride a thousand miles. So it depends on how much I do and see and where I want to go because I have no idea when I wake up in the morning, except I'm headed towards uh, Lake uh, Huron again in a place called Tobermory to catch a ferry sometime in the future, which will carry me to the largest island in a freshwater lake in the world, and it's called Manitoulin. And it's um, someplace that I've been once for several hours, and I found it fascinating, and I want to go back, and the way I'm going to do it is by bicycle. Wow, you're a man of adventure for sure. So to start off this interview, I wanted to jog your memory a little bit. And for our listeners, if you can recall what it was like in 2008 when you were first diagnosed with multiple myeloma, how did you take the news of that diagnosis? Oh, it was earth shattering for me. I had just come back with my wife then from uh, Costa Rica. I had terrible pain in my back and my ribs. I didn't know why. I thought I broke a rib uh, lifting a kayak and I just thought, maybe I'm getting a little old for this outdoorsy stuff. And we got back to Europe into Vienna. And um, in May of 2008, the doctor that first saw me, a GP said, I don't know what you have, but it's not good. And we're going to try to get you in a hospital right away. So I was in a hospital for about nine days because it was 2008 and they couldn't find out what was wrong with me. They did the x-rays of the rib and all that stuff. Finally, after a multiple series of blood tests, they came up with a diagnosis of uh, multiple myeloma. It shattered me because I was always healthy and outdoorsy and like to do this kind of stuff. And I thought my world was ending. So they sent me to a specialist, one of the people who works with IMF from Europe. His name is Dr. Heinz Ludwig. And um, Heinz is now a friend who is also my doctor. When I'm over there, he, he makes sure to take care of me when I do European trips. But basically, I was in such pain that I just didn't know what the next step was. And if you could take me through what your treatment journey has been like since that time, and if you're undergoing any treatment right now, or if you're holding steady, and how how things are going for you. My treatments then, just like you said in the intro, I had uh, first radiation, 15 bouts to help to remove the lesions from my ribs and back and spine. And then I was very weak. I went from a normal 160, 65 pounds down to 119 pounds. So the myeloma was doing something to eat me from the inside out. So I lost a lot of weight. I was feeling very lethargic and I just was in so much pain that uh, they began to put me on the different pain medications, Norco and and uh, things like that, and I wasn't getting better. So after the treatment of radiation, they said, you have to go home now to build up strength, 
uh, eat more. Try, I couldn't eat anything because I was so sick, but uh, I was force fed by my wife. Keep eating, keep eating. And uh, I got a little bit of weight back. But what really helped me, and it's um, a little further down, uh, I could not go home because we had a three-story house and I couldn't climb two stairs. So my wife said, I'm going to work on this and find a place where we can stay so you can get stronger to take the chemotherapy next. And my chemotherapy was due in about two weeks if I built up enough strength, two weeks to three weeks. We went to Helen Kreitz Monastery in the Vienna woods of Vienna. The monks adopted me as a special intention to make an abbot from World War II a saint. They want to make this abbot Carl Brownstorfer for a saint. And to do that, they need uh, two miracles. So they wanted me to be one miracle. And then uh, they would find something else that could be a miracle for the second one. They said, uh, we don't care that you're not Catholic. We care that you're cured. And because if you're cured, then our prayers are working. And I said, hey, if it works for you, it works for me too. After the uh, two weeks with the monks, they continue to pray for me today. But then I went into chemotherapy in June of um, 2008. I began it. In 2008, the summer was completely lost to me. I didn't know what happened. When I uh, started treatment, it took about eight months to get through. I had complications. I had, you know, developed herpes, developed this, developed that. And I was only staying very weak. I was using a walker at that time. And uh, when I came out of the hospital, I was in a wheelchair. When I went to visit the monks, they took me in an ambulance, not knowing how, that's how sick I was. I went to visit the monks the first time they drove me in an ambulance because I, I was that weak. And I mm -hmm. thought that was the end of the road for me. So the chemotherapy was very rough. It was a Johnson and Johnson and Jansen Selig uh, trial study I was in. I don't know the name of the trial study, but Dr. Ludwig does. But um, in Vienna, there were 16 of us, and I did uh, average. Um, I went through it. Then they were going to try and do a stem cell transplant, but I developed, again, complications with herpes in my body, so they had to delay it. They did the harvest in September, thinking that I would get my new stem cells at Christmas, but it didn't happen till Easter the following year of 2009. So I had to develop, I had to get stronger. I had to get ability not to be sick so that the stem cells that they harvested could be reintroduced. Now, usually when people get their stem cells harvested, there's millions and millions of stem cells you work with. Um, Dr. Ludwig said, Andy, we got one more than you need. The, the normal is 3,000 for, or 3 million for one transplant. You had 3 million and one. He was kidding, but it was nip and tuck if I would have enough even stem cells to do a transplant. So the transplant happened in April of 2009. I was still using a walker. I was, um, very weak still. I was beginning to get some weight back with the help of my wife's, um, you know, saying, eat, 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 got to eat. And I said, I don't like any food. But after a while, it all began to come together. So 2009, April was um, the transplant. By June, I was getting antsy. I, I was using Nordic walking sticks to walk around because of the pain in the spine and the ribs. And uh, I walked all through our village. It was called Close to Neuburg in uh, Austria. And when I, it's a suburb of Vienna. And I was still seeing the doctors like every week, nearly. I wasn't, I wasn't, in my opinion, improving, but I was improving enough that I was beginning to agitate myself that I wasn't 
dying and yet I wasn't living how I used to live before I was diagnosed. So I asked my wife one day, hey, you know, I walked all over town. I walked up and down the river, the Danube. I've seen everything and everybody. I need to go further on. How about we, we had bicycles anyway. So I said, how about I hop on a bicycle? No, you're not hopping on a bicycle because if you fall down with your damaged spine, damaged ribs, you'll become paralyzed and then it'll be a headache for me and, uh, you know, the hospital at, at Vienna. And I said, yeah, but if I don't do that, I'll, I'll just, you know, wither up and die anyway. So I said, come on, let's, let's give it a try. So there were, there are these two uh, protector lions down in Hellingstadt, which is uh, about six miles from the house. I thought if I could ride to the six miles, I could ride back. That'd be 12 miles. That'd be a nice ride along, along the river, no roads. It's all bike trails. So I thought, who's going to bump into me or will I fall down? And I convinced her with a cell phone edition set to, you know, the 911 that I could go out and give it a try. To ride six miles in 2009 in July took me three attempts because I was just too tired. I couldn't go a block or two blocks and I would just go home and say, nope, that's not going to work. And finally, after about August, I was able to ride down to the Lions and back. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to make it. And that's when it began. And then I began to ride bicycle further and further. And in 2010, I, and we came back to California and I hopped on a bicycle here in 2011. And I haven't looked back. I've ridden all over the USA for IMF, all over uh, Europe, Australia, and um, now I'm in Canada for Myeloma Canada. That's amazing. So let me ask you this. You mentioned you, you were act, very active before the myeloma. You said you mentioned kayaking. When did you become passionate about cycling? Was this before or after your myeloma diagnosis? Had you done long distance rides like this before or was this new? No, in 1968, a buddy who was five years older than me, who passed just recently last November from amyloidosis, he went through all of his friends at university. I was just entering university. He was just leaving and he wanted to ride back to his hometown in New York state. And we lived in California at the same university. So he went through all of his older friends and they said, you're nuts. No one's going to ride a bicycle across the United States. Too hot in the summer. You get run over by a semi, whatever. And in 1968, he finally got down to this kid, me, and he said, hey, kid, you want to ride across the United States? I had just turned 19. I had just gotten rid of my old bicycle that I used at the university. And I, you know, said, no, I'm driving a car. Then I got to thinking about it. And he said, you know, we talked some more. And he said, his name was Terry Matthews. If, uh, if you pick the route, since you're a geography major, um, and we end up in New York, I don't care where we go as long as we're back in time for school you know, for my school. So I said, hmm, that sounds kind of interesting. So I asked my mom and my dad and they said, um, sounds kind of nutty. Terry came over and we all talked together. And uh, it was uh, May of 1968. We hopped on the bicycles, decided to go. And I said, I want to see an alligator in the wild. That was my reason to go with him. So I thought all the alligators were in the Everglades. I didn't know we would start seeing alligators in uh, East Texas around Houston and not stop seeing them till North Carolina. But I saw umpteen alligators on this journey across the USA. We had many, many adventures. Uh, that was the first trip. After that, I went again when I got out of the Army in 1970. When I got out in 73, I took a trip across the United States again from the Queen Mary in Long Beach to the Washington Monument. I did that one in 19 days and five hours. I was self-supporting and I just booked it. I averaged 142 miles a day 
and I was in the best shape of my life after the military. And my best day was 203 miles on a bicycle in Kansas wow. with a tailwind. And after that trip, I got into the whitewater rafting, the kayaking, and all the adventure sports that uh, kept me going in adventures all my life until the myeloma diagnosis in 2008. And then I had to change gears and I was thinking walker, I was thinking wheelchair, I was thinking, you know, stair lifts. And all of a sudden I began to think bicycle again in that summer of 2009. And like I say, I got stronger. I said, I can do this. I told my wife what I'm gonna do for the myeloma community. And I went to a um, family uh, meeting in Vienna and I met some people, including my doctor there. And I said, this is what I want to do. Do you think I can do it? And Dr. Heinz Ludwig said, if you think you can do it, you can do it. So I hopped on the bicycle with an old high school friend in 2010. The first trip is that we did was from um, Newport Beach up to uh, uh, Bullhead City, Arizona. And I did it as a fundraiser for IMF and I did it for myself to see if I could. And Tom was along to support me, my buddy Tom Manet, in case I uh, had an issue or a problem. But we didn't have any problem and we did it in five days, 300 plus miles over to uh, Bullhead City and then we got a lift back from his brother. So it was a one-way trip. And uh, the next year I said, okay, I'm gonna redo the 1968 trip and meet people along the way, which I did. I met the people in support group meetings because it was 2011, 2012, right up until COVID. And now I, all the meetings are virtual or at least most of them are virtual. So I haven't met too many people. And so this gives me the opportunity for people to meet me and to know not to give up. This idea of uh, this podcast is a good thing. And I understand you make a lot of adaptations to do these rides. You mentioned in your blog, you were Crocs because I think you've had some neuropathy in your legs. You Still yes. wearing them. Excellent. <laughs> what are the things that you did, have you done to adapt with um, living with myeloma and, and some of the side effects that you might have from or complications that you deal with and riding your bicycle what besides wearing crocs what other things that you do to kind of get along on your ride well i i take a you know my multivitamin and uh, magnesium and vitamin d you know uh, medications and and uh, vitamins that way but i i am not on any treatments at this time and I haven't been since 2011. The last treatment that was given to me was Zometa. I haven't had any bone pain issues, except again, I broke my pelvis uh, in 2019, which kind of, I fell off my bicycle on a training ride and, and uh, I couldn't ride for about six months. And then another myeloma patient said, you got to get back on your bicycle to, <laughs> to be you. And uh, that was um, in 2019. And I went through that and got better. And in 2020, I did not ride. In 2021, I rode from Kansas City to Albany, New York on the two trails, the Katy Trail across Kansas and Missouri and the Erie Canal Trail across New York from Buffalo because I met a doctor at a conference in um, Heidelberg, Germany, and he invited me to come back. His name, he now works at uh, Roswell Park in uh, Buffalo, New York, and he's the head of the myeloma unit up there. And um, his name is Dr. Jens Hillengas, and he's also my friend. My doctors have become my friends, just like Susie and Dr. Dury are my friends. And whenever I'm in Hollywood, I drop in and see them. That's excellent. I know that you mentioned that you were in the monastery and they, they, you were one of the miracles they were working toward. Um, and Heinz Ludwig, Dr. Heinz Ludwig treated you for my loma when you were first diagnosed. I understand you did a trip where you went back to revisit that abbey. What was that like yeah. and what connection like to that monastery? 
That was uh, very interesting because in 2018, the year before actually COVID began to be a problem, I was, um, I told myself, I, I want to go to that Heidelberg meeting with Dr. Jens Hillengas, and I wanted to do it through Vienna to Prague in the Czech Republic because my ancestry is Czechoslovakian and then over to Heidelberg that way and explore some new country. Well, the monks heard because I keep in touch with them because they want to know that I'm okay because the, I'm their pending miracle. So they said, well, if you're coming back to Vienna, you have to stop in. So I stopped in for four, they um, hosted me for four days in um, the monastery. A chapter of Cistercian monks um, there's about 93 of them. They all know me in terms of this pending miracle, but they wined and dined me and, uh, you know, entertained me and took me into the little catacombs that the normal people don't get to go in. And, uh, you know, all the stuff that you never think you would get to do as a, just a yay who riding a bicycle, but they like what I'm doing. And so they pray for me five times a day. That's their normal prayer regime. I think it's working. Uh, you know, uh, I like I said, I'm not Catholic. I'm Greek Catholic, Russian Orthodox. It's a Christian faith for sure, but it's not Roman Catholic. And they said, hey, as long as uh, we're working for you, you work for us and get better or stay better because I, I don't need to get better. If I can ride 50 miles a day, and not get off the bike and feel okay, then I guess I'm doing good. And also, other than this memory with the, the monks, there's so many stories you've already shared. What are maybe, if you can narrow down, it's probably really hard to determine having gone to Australia, Europe, US, Canada, two or three of your fondest memories of people you've met or experiences that you've had while you've been cycling. The 1968 trip. We landed on the 1968 trip in uh, New York City, we were trying to get on the Johnny Carson show, uh, Terry and I, and we thought it would be a good story. Well, we didn't know that at the time because in 1968, you didn't have cell phones, you didn't have contact, you were on a bicycle all day. So we didn't know the world was erupting in Czechoslovakia with the um, Alexander Ducek, the premier of uh, Czechoslovakia was being ousted by the Russians. And we were at the UN, we were passing by the UN building at 4.30 in the afternoon. There were about um, five to 10,000 people in front of the UN screaming, help the Czechs, help the Czechs, help the Czechs. And uh, I, during a little lull in the demonstration, I went, hey, I'm Czech, help me. I just rode a bicycle from California. I'm looking for a place to stay and something to eat. And at that point, the uh, New York Police Department uh, officers came up and said, look, if you two don't leave here right now, we're going to arrest you for disturbing the peace and constituting an illegal assembly. And we left that naturally, but we, we felt a little short sheeted by New York as our arrival day, we were excited that we crossed the Staten Island Ferry from Staten Island. We went by the Statue of Liberty. There were no World Trade Centers. Then it was the Empire State Building. And neither of us had, had been to New York. And here we were in the Big Apple and we were gonna be arrested on our arrival. That was pretty exciting. And we didn't get arrested and, and life turned out all right. Other people just on the trips, Cindy down in Florida, one of the IMF uh, group leaders, she, I, I spoke in Jacksonville at the meeting in I think 2012 or 13, when I rode from New Orleans to Jacksonville. That in itself was a great meeting and a great lady. And she hosted me at her house and at the meeting. And she said, you're terrific. And we hope you keep going. And then a year later, uh, another special meeting. Uh, there was a gentleman, uh, his name was Pat Killingsworth. He had myeloma. He wrote a couple of books on getting through transplants. And I met him at a couple of meetings, including our own in Orange County. And he said, uh, 
you're my hero. And I said, Pat, I've read your books. You're my hero too. Well, I, they had a, a Pat Killingsworth memorial on one of the islands. I think it was Amelia Island in 2015. And I said, I'm going to go to that meeting. Since I had been in Jacksonville, I flew into Jacksonville again with a bicycle and I rode up to uh, Pittsburgh where I was born. But I spent time with the big group of uh, myeloma patients on that island. And we said goodbye to Pat the best way we could. And a lot of us remember Pat fondly because of his books and his positive attitude. And that's what I'm trying to do is keep the positive attitude so that um, people who have now been diagnosed and don't know what to do can see that there can be a way to continue life normally. Although riding a bicycle a thousand miles isn't normal, but it's normal for me. And it's something that uh, they go, I can't even walk right now. How can I ride a bicycle? Well, you have to take those first baby steps. I used a walker, the walking sticks, finally began to walk further get stronger and eventually found something. It might not be a bicycle for the next person, but it might be a kayak or something that they can do that gets them out and gives them joy. And the bicycle gives me joy. That's wonderful. And how do your loved ones feel about your cycling? They think I'm crazy, but they love me for it. (laughs) And is there any location that you haven't been yet that you're thinking, gosh, that's next on my list? I told myself, and um, when I travel, I have a business card, and it's a, it's an introduction card. You know, on a bicycle in other parts of the world, there are people with myeloma, and that's why it's the International Myeloma Foundation, around the world. And they're all panicking when they get the diagnosis. What's that mean? Well, my card, they look at me and they go, what's an old guy like you with myeloma doing out here? But even the people who don't have myeloma know somebody with myeloma or someone who passed with myeloma. Once they see the card, it opens up doors, avenues, a chance to talk to people. So I hand the card out and uh, then I see what happens. And usually only good things happen in terms of they say, let me take you to lunch. Let's let's talk about myeloma. My father has it. How can I help him to do better or my wife or my mother or whatever? And uh, it gives me a chance to tell them my story, but it also gives them a chance to relax a little bit, knowing that it's the diagnosis is not the end of the world. It's just another illness you have to cope with. Um, Now, to get back to the question, when my cards run out, I'm 73, I'll be 74 on this bike ride. I have enough cards to finish Canada and one more trip. And that trip is going to be Australia and New Zealand. And I'm going to leave in January of this coming year, uh, if everything goes good, I will ride the South Island first. I will meet my sister on the North Island because she's a bromeliad fanatic, which is a flowering plant that doesn't require fertilization. It gets it from the air. And she's going to a conference in Auckland. So then we'll uh, goof around. We'll rent a car. I'll meet her in the North Island after January, February, March. I'll explore the South Island. She comes over in March, has her conference. We'll have a rental car because she doesn't bike much and then uh she'll and we'll see the north island for about a week and then i will go to explore the north island on the bicycle after she leaves to go to melbourne australia where her her daughter lives and then i'm going to take that bicycle this bicycle i've been riding on all those trips and i will give it to my niece's sons they're just coming of age where they might want to be explorers and if they don't want to be maybe their father will be in terms of uh their life in australia 
and then I'll spend uh, May and June visiting friends in Australia that I made when I was on a trip to Australia several years ago. And then I will go to Europe one more time to say hello to Dr. Ludwig and uh, other friends I have in Europe. And then with luck, see the monks one more time. I don't think they'll turn me away. And then I'll retire from this, I think 14, well, it's going to be 13 years will be sufficient as a, that doesn't mean I'm retiring from bicycling, just touring. That will be what I'm doing. The Australia trip will, New Zealand, Australia, I, I plan to run out of the last of the business cards. I told myself I'm not making any more of them, my introduction cards, and I'll let the younger people take over for me whoever the next person is. And where can listeners learn more about your cycling adventures? Well, I'm on the uh, IMF website uh, with a fundraiser page. I have a fundraiser through IMF. I have a fundraiser page with Myeloma Canada for those people who are needing some sort of support. The best way to do it is to look at the different um, agencies and the International Myeloma Foundation has been very good to me. So I, I would hope that uh, between those, and I have my crazy guy on the bike site, which um, if you email me at volk, V-O-L-C-A-N-D-Y at hotmail.com, I will put you on my mailing list. My crazy guy on the bike, I just started when I left uh, the border down in the beginning of Canada there in a town called Ipperwash on Lake Huron. And it's going to run through, and I'm going to ride through September, which is uh, Blood Cancer Awareness Month, and multiple myeloma is a blood cancer. So I will have uh, about five weeks to finish the 1,000 miles. I don't see that being a problem because I already did 300 in five days. I may have to slow down a little bit or I'll be done by uh, next week. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andy, for being our guest today. I know the IMS member fundraiser team is incredibly grateful to you for all the efforts you put towards raising money for the International Myeloma Foundation. As you mentioned, you have a fundraiser going right now for the IMF. And if you want to learn more about that as a listener, you can find Andy's fundraiser on the Myeloma website at fundraising.myeloma.org slash bicycle hyphen Mojave. If you have trouble finding that, we will post it on this web page where you can find the podcast. Also, you can email Andy at volcandy at hotmail.com, which is V-O-L-C-A-N-D-Y at hotmail.com if you want to get on his mailing list of his, his crazy guy on a bike website. If you didn't get any of this information, we'll have a transcript along with this podcast to if you want to read through it. And thank you again, Andy, for joining us and good luck on the rest of your ride. I, I'm looking forward to dropping more photos into the IMF site and the uh, Myeloma Canada site as I cruise along towards uh, Manitoulin Island and then points whoever knows where I'll be next, but I'll stay in touch. You've been listening to a Day in the Life podcast brought to you by the International Myeloma Foundation. To learn more about the IMF and myeloma, visit us at myeloma.org.